Hello and welcome to News Click. Today we are joined by Ambassador M K Bhadra Kumar, and we are going to be talking about a country where he has served in, which is very much in the news right now for actually a lot of wrong reasons. That's Afghanistan. There's been a lot of violence. The U.S. is withdrawing. A lot of concern about what is likely to happen in the coming months, but also quite a few possibilities. So, Ambassador Bhadra Kumar, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. It's always a pleasure, Prasant. Actually, sir, so the first question is something I think that's on the minds of everyone right now, which is regarding what exactly the Taliban strategy looks like, because we do know that they have captured a huge amount of uh, territory in the past few weeks. The number of districts under their control has risen uh, considerably, and there is a lot of speculation that you know, as as soon as the U.S. withdraws within a few months, they might be pushing towards Kabul. They might take over large parts of the country. So, do you see that as being integral to the Taliban's plan, or is there are there other aspects they're looking at? Well, that this is uh, obviously the most uh, important and the most uh, pressing question today. You know, when we discuss Afghanistan, um, I start with a stunner. You know, in the sense that you know, it's uh, in the Indian opinion, it is uh, very difficult for a large number of people who are weaned on the Indian narrative to accept this. What I'm going to say, but the fact of the matter is that the Taliban is not terribly interested in a military takeover. Uh, my assessment has been for some time, and continues to be, that uh, neither Pakistan nor the Taliban. Is interested in a military takeover, uh, not necessarily for the same reasons, but there is a confluence of interest there. I can explain it briefly. Most importantly, the Taliban is uh, acutely conscious of the fact that it must have international legitimacy, and that international legitimacy, if they do in a ghastly way, seize power in Kabul. Will be surely denied to them at the United Nations Security Council, and so we'll have a replay of the late 1990s. And the Taliban has gone through that. In fact, the whole nexus with the Al Qaeda, for people who do not know, or I would like to jog their memory, the entire nexus to Al Qaeda was actually a result of the denial of legitimacy and international recognition to the Taliban. In the 1990s, they were insistently knocking on the doors of the Americans to give them a recognition and at least to you know so that they can tap into the United Nations uh, welfare programs and you know whether it is some food and public health and overall development and so on. But they were denied that, and all they were left with the Arab money from Saudi Arabia and the Emiratis, who were uh, whose sheikhs were funding the Taliban. So it naturally took them to the Al Qaeda. Now it is not in Pakistan's interest also to see that. Uh, now this is the most important factor in the Taliban's um, what I can call zone of consideration at this point. Then uh, there are many other things also, and one other important factor that the Taliban would certainly have in mind is that a military conquest of Afghanistan will require. Almost direct Pakistani intervention, as it happened in the 1990s. Is Pakistan ready for it? Is Pakistan capable of it? Is Pakistan willing for it? Is Pakistan's friends and allies going to? Are they going to allow Pakistan to do that? All these are very important questions. You know, then we have to put these things, these questions, uh, in the context, in the backdrop of the. Highly fluid, volatile international situation today, in terms of the U.S.-China rivalry and so on, and Pakistan is also a huge stakeholder now in the regional stability, having uh, waded into the river of the CPEC, and uh, is seeing the other shore already, and uh, seeing the potentials of it for a better future for Pakistan itself. Then there are uh, many other uh, strands there which we do not. Uh, Recognize here because we have uh, stereotyped views of Pakistan, uh, namely that Pakistan also has a sense of destiny. It is not that 
Pakistan is reveling in association with these groups uh, for its own sake, it must all lead to somewhere. And that somewhere today is in terms of a regional cooperation, which is important for Pakistan to tap the full potential of CPEC. After all, what is the point in developing Gwadar port? It is actually a port head for an entire region, the Central Asian region. So you can imagine if you look at the map itself that, you know, these dreams become such absurd notions if there is no stability in Pakistan. And uh, then there is the there is the blowback aspect, which is, uh, I think, from recent statements of the uh, top leadership, it's really worrying them that, you know, that this blowback uh, will uh, sink Pakistan. If there is a blowback in the sense that if there is a an ascendance, untrammeled ascendance of uh, Islamic military, uh, military uh, militant uh, uh, trend in Kabul, in Afghanistan, there is going to be a blowback into Pakistan. And that will be, uh, it will be difficult for the Pakistani state to contain that and at the same time to uh, proceed with the developmental processes and so on. So therefore, the short point is that uh, uh, the regional states have a very good, op and the international community and the Americans even today, have a very good opportunity today to see that the, uh, the energies are therefore diverted to the negotiating table. How do we do that? The, basically the problem, Pakistan is in a dilemma, Americans in a dilemma, Pakistan is, uh, United States is also in a dilemma in the sense that uh, the, uh, the course that was chartered in, at the Doha, uh, talks by Khalil Saad and the Taliban leaders and Khalil Saad I think uh, essentially got an optimal uh, deal for the United States. There's a lot of criticism about him but it's unfair in the sense that we are not uh, really remembering the context in which these talks commenced and the talks went on. There is a very tortuous process and, uh, you know, to bring them to the table, the Taliban to the table itself was a very, very, very big achievement. So considering all this, um, you know, the uh, effort should be to take the process to the negotiating table. Now, my understanding of the Afghans is that an understanding, an agreement reached with them, they take it very seriously. They take it very seriously. So you see, for instance, you know, the uh, Taliban uh, sort of uh, uh, fighting shy of, you know, giving any undertakings and agreements because uh, they take it seriously. It's in the Afghan nature. It's not only typical of the Taliban. And uh, the assurance was given to them that there will be a certain mainstreaming of the Taliban in terms of a transitional process in Afghanistan through the formation of an interim government an interim government in which they will be present along with the, all the other Afghan groups. It was a tremendous achievement to get them to agree to that because these are people who were wedded to the Islamic Emirate and to come from there to say that they are prepared to work within a broad-based arrangement was a very big achievement on the part of uh, the Americans. They'd managed that up to that. And then they came against the rock, you know, and uh, the rock was uh, the... Afghan government's reluctance to abdicate. Now, here we get into the theater of the absurd in the sense that this is a government which is only a government notionally. Its mandate is uh, like, uh, I wrote recently that Ghani polled something like five lakhs votes, something like five lakhs votes in a country with a population of 400 lakhs. Now, this was put in perspective when you speak about the legitimate legitimacy aspect of this government, that we are really in the theater of the absurd. No one minded in 2090 when the election was rigged and the Americans imposed these fellows on uh, Afghanistan and the region and the international community, because the international community knew that the Americans were calling the shots. And therefore, it really didn't matter who these fellows were, you know, at that point in time. But now the situation is very serious. We are getting into the, a situation where Afghanistan is going to regain its uh, sovereignty and independence and will formulate policies which will, uh, which will be representing the wishes of the people and uh, which will impact regional security 
profoundly. And therefore, everyone is interested to see that, you know, the legitimacy aspect is important. And it is precisely this legitimacy aspect, I would say, that necessitates the creation of an interim government in Kabul. So when you speak, Prashant, about the shape of things to come, it's in our hands to mold it. And I hope that this uh, Shanghai Cooperation Organization Ministerial, where China is taking the initiative to have a regional uh, process begin seriously, will take us somewhere. And uh, because this is probably the last train leaving the station. Now, I do not want to even think about it, but I must still mention it. What will happen if this process towards interim government doesn't materialize? Taliban take over. I don't think that any state, including India, which probably you know is supporting to the hilt this government in Kabul, will be in a position to stop it. And in that case, if that kind of a process, an obdurate setup, like in Haiti or somewhere, taking place in uh, Kabul, in Afghanistan, then with a tacit American support or without American support, tacit American support will be there for these guys. If that happens, you know, it will be a replay of what you have in Haiti today. You know, that is what we are going to create there. And how long is it going to be tenable? Which country is going to be interested in perpetuating that sort of a thing in the region? A cancer, creating a cancer in the region. So I think the Taliban will win inevitably later. And Pakistan will then have to see to it that the Taliban will win as a factor of stability for the region. So the choice is to answer your question. We are uh, really at a T-junction. You know, we could take uh, either either road. And uh, by this uh, weekend, I think things will clarify to some extent as to where uh, we are heading. Right, absolutely. So in this context, you mentioned the kind of issues of legitimacy that is faced by the Ashraf Ghani government. And that's a very important point because uh, in recent times, for instance, they have declared that they're willing to arm some of the militias. There's a long history of regions being dominated by very powerful warlords, some of whom were integrated into the government. So right now, uh, assuming that, of course, uh, the process of this interim government formation, if it happens, will still take time. Do we see this existing government being able to continue its influence or do we see uh, you know, more, more of the warlordism that we saw in the late 80s and 90s? You see, I see some uh, hopeful signs through the last... 48, 72 hours. Now, um, I see the signals primarily from Kabul. Uh, Hamid Kansai, former president, wields, uh, we may not realize because India is, he today stands for Afghanistan to an extreme extent as a nationalist, and it doesn't really uh, match with Indian policies. So we probably don't have much time for him. But I think he's very important role. It's a very important role that he's playing. He went and uh, with Sayaf, Rasul Sayaf, who is, uh, by the way, who is, um, I, must, I have met him, and probably the only Indian diplomat who has met him. He was the uh, leader of the uh, Itihad group, which is a Wahhabi group in the Afghan Jihad of 1990s. And for those who do not know, Jalaluddin Haqqani, the founder of the Haqqani network, as we call it today, was his commander. So you can imagine where he stood at that time. And in fact, when I went to meet him, when I was going to meet him and I informed uh, Masood that I was going to see him, uh, they discouraged me. They said that he is rabidly anti-Indian. Do not go because we, can, we have no control over his territory. And if you move into Parwan, uh, then you know we will lose touch with you and we will not be able to rescue you. So, yeah, so I said, I'll take a calculated choice because I have the signal that, you know, that they will uh, make sure of my security. Mm -hmm. So I went there and I met him. Now, you know, uh, he's, I said this about him, because his, him, his background, because um, Karzai brought into that room for the meeting with Ashraf Ghani two days ago, where Abdullah was also present. Uh, 
a proposition that the country has what I explained just earlier, that the country is at, a, uh, at the threshold of a uh, big decision. And that unless we, and he said, uh, according to some versions, that uh, what is it that is preventing us from talking? We are all Afghanistan, we are all Afghans. That is Taliban and uh, Ghani and everybody, we are all Afghans. Why are we fighting shy of it? We should talk to each other. So I have a feeling, you know, that, uh, you know, the, what we do not understand is that the Afghans have also their own traditional culture for consensus making. Because of the Pakistani interference and so on, that has been lying mute, uh, you know, through the past uh, couple of decades or something. But um, that is still there, you know, the, the, the tribal uh, culture, the network, and their Pakhtun Wali uh, sense of honor and all that, you know, it is still there. How can it go in, a, in, a, in, a, in a, uh, an element which is deeply embedded in their psyche? So you see, um, uh, Kani also must be realizing this, that, you know, that uh, there are certain people in his circle who were essentially CIA agents and occupying high positions today, who were trained by the CIA and in intelligence work and put in the key nerve centers of the uh, Afghan establishment uh, to see that the American wishes are carried out so that it is a closed shop, the intelligence and defense establishment of Afghanistan and the NATO. Now, these people are, some of them, a uh, couple of them at least, you know, are occupying very high positions. At least one of them is a very important position. Now, for these people, it is obviously the end of the road because, you know, they, they, they have settled their families abroad in India or wherever. But, uh, you know, they, do, they too will have to leave. And that is actually becoming Afghanistan government's agenda. You know, as, as in plain terms, that is what is happening. And... Uh, I think, you know, in fairness, we should give them safe passage and, and uh, encourage them to get lost. That is all one can say. But uh, Ghani himself, uh, I don't think, would be obdurate uh, in this, uh, on this path. And uh, after this meeting, uh, to continue what I was saying, I have noticed that uh, Abdullah left for Doha. And um, uh, now, there are a lot of other things, you know, this didn't happen in a vacuum. Khalil Saad was in Kabul and was in Doha and all that is taking place. He's in Pakistan and all that. So all that is there in the background. So there are so many churnings there. And it, it is in amidst that that this has happened that um, uh, Abdullah left. Abdullah has an official titular position. He's, uh, he heads the team of negotiators notionally. And, uh, you know, and he's uh, uh, taken an assurance that he will seriously negotiate. And it should not be that, you know, somebody uses him as a, as a front. So he left. And the important thing is, uh, Kazai has accompanied him. And uh, then word has come from uh, Doha that uh, they are meeting this Friday. And now, you know, so you see the sequence of events, you know, China as the biggest stakeholder in security and stability of Afghanistan today, because their internal security is linked to this. And they take it bloody seriously, I can tell you, that, you know, that they'll take it seriously. It's not the CPIC, it's not the BRI, the Belt and Road Initiative or anything. It is their internal security and stability of Xinjiang, frankly. That is what it is bothering them. And they are now, you know, really gone almost at the diplomatic plane, they're gone berserk. And they don't have an option and they do not want to exercise an option of a military intervention in, Afghan in Afghanistan. They are not foolish enough for that. And it will be inconsistent with a fundamental principle in their foreign policy that they will not interfere in the internal affairs of another country. Simple as that. So you see, that process is taking place and it is going to play out in Dushanbe and Tashkent today, uh, this week. There's an international conference where uh, Imran Khan is going, where Khalil Saad is present, Khani's people are there and all that. So, you know, uh, that it is against that, that this team has uh, uh, left for Doha, Abdullah and uh, Kazai. And I'm very sure even people like Sayaf are associated with it because Sayaf, Abdullah, I mean, uh, um, uh, Karzai took Sayaf 
for this meeting with uh, Kani. So all of these are hopeful signs in the sense that uh, there is a realization and the spoilers on the American side dare not now try to derail this because that is essentially the Pentagon and the CIA and the so-called deep state in America. Uh, but uh, they know now that uh, Biden wants seriously this war to end and he is not in it in any form for a continuation. Uh, you know, a, a plan B, so to speak, for the war to continue. So uh, I think they are now, it is symbolic that uh, day before yesterday, the commander of the American forces relinquished. Now, this is very highly symbolic. It is a, it is a distancing. It's a distancing that is uh, visible there. Because it is just the Pentagon spokesman had said just a few days ago, we had a briefing, that with the White House's concern, General Miller is going to stay there at least for two more weeks, at least for two more weeks. And now he's just left and handed over the charge to his successor, who will be in a virtual mode operating out of Florida. And you can imagine what kind of a war the Americans uh, are going to be capable of fighting with the general sitting in Florida, you know, in a big country like Afghanistan. So you see, uh, they, they tried all the Americans, this military people tried all kinds of things, you know, uh, the, the deep state tried all kinds of things like uh, getting some kind of basing facilities in Central Asia and so on. But um, China did, I think, along with Russia, uh, a splendid thing in ensuring that there is no place for this war to continue uh, to be staged from anywhere in the region. So you see, this sign, if it uh, moves forward, I think the scenario can change. Because then, uh, if there is going to be an agreement towards an interim government, I can tell you 100% Taliban will announce or enter or, uh, or agree to a immediate ceasefire. Right, absolutely. Bloodshed will stop. Mm -hmm. They are indulging in this. One reason is this, that they feel cheated after the Doha Pact, that they waited patiently and this interim government which was promised because they also are exhausted. They also want to get back into mainstreaming, you know, is there. And then the second part is these spoilers, I mentioned to you, these guys who have nowhere to go, who are around the, in, in Khani's circle, they keep needling the Taliban. And you see, this is something which we know can happen and it is in the culture of all intelligence security establishments of any country. And I will not exclude any country. It is this that, you know, that they, they have these shenanigans, you know, they play by, you know, false encounters and all this are part of it. Right. So you see, um, uh, from this point of view, uh, there are some hopeful signs. We have to wait and see. Thank you.